is so amazing. <laughs> these, these things that have become part of our traditions, you know, that we're seeing the science of the ways that shows that that's an important aspect of being able to navigate difficult spaces and, and tragedies um, like the trauma is. So I graduated from Wheaton College um, in 1988 and actually made the decision to go and join a discipleship training school with Youth with a Mission after that. And so I was in uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands for three months and then our team all went to different parts of South America, Bogota, Colombia and Quito, Quito Ecuador for their outreach. And I had been a psych ma major in undergrad but knew I was interested in missions and cross-cultural work. But there was a psychologist who was part of the discipleship training school, a psychologist from England. And it was so striking because everywhere we went, whether it was the being in Amsterdam with the other missionaries that were there, or the time in Bogota, Colombia, everywhere we went, people wanted to talk with her as a therapist and wanted to spend time with her, needed, wanted her counseling. And so she really became a mentor, kind of an ins inspiration at that time and said, why, you know, Cynthia, if you have the capacity, go and get the degree. You know, don't just do like biblical counseling kinds of things, but go and get the degree. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so I applied to some different graduate programs and ended up at Fuller Seminary in their PhD program for clinical psychology. And but stayed in touch with this psychologist who ended up joining the mission field. And in that context, she was going to do relief work with her husband in West Africa, in Liberia, West Africa, in the context of the civil war there. And I was kind of following along, you know, reading the letters she was sending about what was happening and realized like that's what I want to do. And you know, this connection between trauma and the mission field and being in intercultural spaces and really providing support in unique ways. So I actually had the opportunity to go and join her team as a grad student and did my master's research with kids that had been impacted by the Civil War in Liberia. Just loved it. I can still picture myself standing on a balcony in you know, the, the space that the organization had for both our offices and our housing. And I remember thinking like, this is it. I love this. This is kind of like my center point. And so really thought that I was going to end up doing cross-cultural service and bringing psychology and mental health and psychosocial services into missions in intercultural spaces. And I sort of got back to Fuller, had my own re-entry sort of challenge of like, wow, what am I doing here studying psychology when there are kids dying in Africa and, you know, kind of overwhelmed with that and then thought I'd go back for my dissertation work. That was my intent. And the Civil War had increased so much that it wasn't safe to go back. And the team that I had been part of had actually been evacuated. So I started trying to figure out in my, like reorienting myself, well, what am I gonna do now? And it was actually a recruiter from World Vision who said, we're really struggling with staff coming back from the field, being traumatized. You know, staff that were so used to being our, like, cowgirls and cowboys and you know going out and doing the hard work they're coming back from Rwanda and saying I'm done and so that was really an inspiration to start looking at what were the needs of staff both my own experience of re-entering after this experience in, in Liberia my own disorientation related to that and then hearing about so many staff being traumatized so that set me on a trajectory to do my dissertation with Christian relief and um, development workers that were serving around the world, what their experiences were like on the field, and then how they navigated coming back to the States and re-entering and their experience of PTSD. That study, so interesting kind of psych serving missions, that study doesn't necessarily name that those organizations were all Christian organizations, but that was the first study published in this area of humanitarian aid work, stress, and trauma. And so the extraordinary opportunity then of realizing, like I was hearing from colleagues that were, you know, someone who did staff care in UNICEF saying, I cite your, your project. You know, this is something I bring to the organization showing how important it is for us to do staff care. This kind of early experience of saying, getting the evidence and doing the research is a very important part of advocacy for recognizing the needs in these communities and the ways that there's a Christian ethic around how we care for each other. And you know, so much of ministry can be very sacrificial, but how do we think about what God is actually calling us to in doing that ministry? It's not calling 
others to serve, to sacrifice themselves for the sake of this ministry without recognizing that God wants them to form too. So I thought that I was going to actually back, end up back on the mission field and that was my expectation after I graduated and was very surprised when I ended up falling in love and marrying a landscape architect from Arcadia, California, which was a point of prayer, like, God, why did that happen? But I had this really wonderful time of prayer of really like seeking God, what is, is this really what your intention is? And felt like God really gave me a sense of peace and confirmation of that. Shortly after we got married, there was an opportunity to actually pursue an academic position that was an endowment that had been given by the Headington family of Dallas, Texas to support a program at Fuller looking at the needs of cross-cultural service workers and their experience of trauma and burnout. So it was this extraordinary opportunity to actually become an academic centered on this very area of trauma and international service. So that's how I ended up at Fuller as an academic. So I started at Fuller in 1990 as a student, thought I'd be leaving and going pretty far, stayed at Fuller, and now here I am 23 years later as a faculty member and now the chair of our PsyD program, but have continued to focus my research over the years in this intersection of ministry and cross-cultural service and trauma and spirituality and kind of publishing work that really emphasizes how trauma and spirituality interact, advocating for people during different kinds of service, you know, whether that's international aid workers or national staff in the, in the context where they live that are doing aid work and the different factors that help them have resilience. And then I've had the opportunity to do some other kinds of things that because I work at a seminary, there's constant sort of intersection between psychology and ministry. So one of the real joys over the years of being a faculty member has been the opportunity to co-teach courses for students in all the programs at Fuller that are looking at factors of you know, psychological kinds of science and, and understanding mental health with things like you know, missionary service. So I've co-taught a class called Self and Community Care and Mission for about 15 years with one of my colleagues who is a missiologist who during urban missions in the LA area. Now I also co-teach a class called Trauma and Faith with a colleague from, who's also a missiologist, who's a Latina, who's done um, immigration justice work for 40 years. So this unique opportunity to bring both of our voices to students that are preparing to do ministry in different settings and kind of challenging them to think about how they're doing their work, how they're conceptualizing their work, continuing to learn and be challenged each way of like all the things that I don't know that my missiology colleagues know, the things that they don't know that I bring language to and having that ongoing dialogue. So it's been a, it's been a real joy. One of the lenses that I bring to that reflection on this intersection between trauma and faith or trauma and spirituality is I kind of bring a biblical anthropology of who God made us to be. God created us to be people in relationship and the amazing way that social support continues to be one of the most important resilience factors when it comes to the experience of trauma or tragedy. You know, we need relationships. God made us to be in relationships and those relationships are part of protecting us when really tragic and awful things happen or we're in communities that are in ongoing oppression and the trauma doesn't end. You know, we need each other in those spaces um, and I really see that as part of God, God's gift. And then another way I see God's gift is how he made us with this fight, flight or freeze response. You know, so our nervous system. And that's been really fun. There's been more recent theory and work around the neurobiology and um, neurology of trauma response that has helped be able to talk to people about what's happening in your body, how you feel in your body, how agitated your body might feel when something feels threatening, and what does it mean to activate the other part of our nervous system that God created that's called the parasympathetic nervous system that is actually like a brake pedal, that God has given us this natural way of being able to calm. And I really love that one of the ways that we do that is by being silent and breathing deeply and thoughtfully 
and how that relates to so many of the traditions in Christian contemplation. So these seeing these intersections, and then another way that we um, can help calm our nervous system and activate our vagal nerve is by singing and choral singing. I'm like, that is so incredibly cool that when we are singing in a choir or we're singing in church and we're singing hymns together, that our bodies are actually starting to co-regulate, that we start breathing in the same patterns, that our hearts start beating at the same rates, that we're actually helping each other calm down as we sing and that the vocalization and our vocal cords sort of humming, that's activating that vagus nerve as well. That is so amazing. <laughs> These, these things that have become part of our traditions, you know, that we're seeing the science of the ways that shows that that's an important aspect of being able to navigate difficult spaces and, and tragedies um, like the trauma is. So cool. And then there's other theological components that I think are really important, like lament. You know, stepping back and looking at different traditions and, you know, depending on the church tradition you're from, you may or may not have incorporated laments into worship services. When we look at what lament actually does, it gives us this opportunity to express fully the, all of the emotions that we have to God. When we look at the laments in the Psalms, there are laments that talk about being so angry and cursing you know, our enemies and like really awful stuff like dash babies' heads against rocks, kind of like God do all this awful stuff. And it's to kind of recognize that that's part of our canon, that that's part of the church's understanding of what it means to be a person of faith. God intends for us to express the depths of our pain to God and that we, that's part of being in relationship with God, is trusting that God is big enough and safe enough and maybe brave enough to be in that space with him of being true about how bad we feel and maybe even how angry we are with him um, in the situation. And laments are personal and laments are also communal. And what does it mean to, as a whole community, be able to speak that or sing that or express that to God in an act of justice, in an act of crying out, in an act of, of complaint, um, in an act of faith, you know, to say we trust God as our creator enough to share how deeply hurt and confused we are at this time. Um, and I find that when I have the opportunity to share with people that framework of understanding the lament and frame it around what it means to be psychologically attached, you know, that this way that it allows us to be attached to God in a depth space, that that becomes this extraordinary like meh, reorientation of, oh, oh, okay, you know, I can do that. And one story I'll share is that I had an opportunity to sit with someone um, who had shared with me, had been disclosed to me, that they had been um, abused by a youth pastor in their church, had been sexually molested by this pastor. And I was amazed that this person was still seeking God, still kind of in the space of being open. And I felt really prompted to read Psalm 88 to her. Psalm 88, if you don't know, is one of the psalms that doesn't end with that like upswing. Like many of the lament psalms end with, but I will trust you, God. And there are a few in scripture, I think it's Psalm 33 and Psalm 88, that don't end like that. And Psalm 88 actually ends with basically this, and it, maybe it would be better if I was dead. You know, just this sense of kind of despair. And I read that psalm to her and, and I said, what was it like to hear that? And she said, comforting. And I thought, wow, you know, comforting. Even though it doesn't end well, even though it doesn't have this positive, God's gonna work out all things for good for those who love him. Scripture like that was there that paralleled and normalized what she was feeling. It was comforting. Yeah, and that's, it is an excellent question to ask about the definition because, because it does, it has changed over the years in terms of 
psychology, clinical psychology, and how it gets described in our diagnostic manual. And then there's also some places of tension in terms of the ways people want chronic types of trauma to be recognized as trauma, like the chronic trauma of racism um, that may not necessarily fit a diagnostic criteria as it's described. So one of the terms that I, or one of the definitions that I use pretty frequently is trauma as a threat to existence. And that could be something as overt as, you know, being caught in a natural disaster and wondering if you're going to survive this tornado or this hurricane or earthquake. It could also be a car accident or it could be a sudden illness, you know, or a chronic illness where there's this awareness of the threat to your physical integrity, your physical existence. But it can also be some of that that more maybe subtle, maybe not so subtle emphasis on not being invisible or being treated like you're not worth anything. So the experience of neglect, of parental neglect, whereas, or parental emotional abuse, where that might not be a physical threat to the child, but it's a threat of their sense of self. And you can see how then that also relates to experiences like racism where treatment by a dominant group um, becomes this threat to the existence. There's also the very real physical threat, you know, for, for black bodies that have been treated in ways that are disposable and, um, and how justice issues kind of center around some of those questions. So that real, very real threat. But then there's also the threat, there's very real racial experience of oppression and threat to existence for other populations like the Asian American population and their experience. So I think this threat of existence helps us to kind of frame it as, there's a lot of different ways that that can look. And then how that relates to what it means to become sort of trauma informed in your ministry means that not only do you need to understand some of the different kinds of symptoms that trauma might look like, I mean, seeing someone kind of glaze over and feel like, wait, are they even there? You know, like, okay, this person may be just dissociated, maybe sort of left, it was just too difficult to be in that space because they were reminded of something or they're having a flashback. So that being something they might see or just hostility you know, being related to sort of that aggression or agitation that could be related to a traumatic experience. This, I think, trauma-informed ministry becomes a place of both recognizing some of the signs and understanding things that could be the results of trauma, but then it's also experiencing or recognizing some of those sociological, cultural, historical, gender dynamics that might contribute to someone feeling traumatized or someone feeling like they're navigating a space of oppression. And I use the term trauma-informed really intentionally because there's been a lot of really wonderful work um, out of government offices like the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Association. They have a model of six principles of being trauma-informed that center on issues of safety, so helping reduce that threat to existence and the important pieces that can be part of a trauma-informed school or a trauma-informed courtroom or trauma-informed informed ER, um, but could be also trauma-informed church. There's also this space of recognizing that being trauma-informed also means being oriented towards empowering others, paying attention to hierarchies that are actually becoming dominant and working to build mutuality, working to emphasize peer support and valuing each other. And I love that. Because then it's like that a pastor doesn't have to sort of have the diagnostic criteria or understand in their heads, well, what are all the symptoms of PTSD? But a pastor can say, all right, you know, what's happening in my community? Who are the different people that are part of this community that may have traumas from their histories? They may be navigating certain traumas in their own communities right now. There may be family dynamics going on or you know, examples of um, intergenerational or family trauma. And then how do I help them feel empowered to make choices for themselves? How do we build ministries that are actually listening to others' voices and not just my own or not just certain people who've been identified as the people in power? That's disruptive. You know, it's, but it's also the priesthood of all believers. So again, I mean, I love the way, I think maybe working at Fuller all these years, I can't 
not think about scripture and theological sort of frameworks as I think about these things that are becoming seen as truths in science. I'm like, but of course, you know, the gospel is very much about seeing the marginalized and empowering them and welcoming the stranger and encouraging them to share the good news. I think about the woman of the well, you know, so who knows what her circumstances were and the ways that she might have experienced trauma in those five other husbands that she had. I, you know, just, just love the way like thinking about what was Jesus doing in those moments and how was that empowering and then what does it mean to bring those same principles into the work that we do in the church. I'm excited about what other kinds of conversations and what other kinds of insights these students coming up behind me are gonna to bring to the community and challenge the church because they're all committed to the church. It's not looking the same and they've, some of them have some significant hurts, but having those conversations and pressing in is what really gets me excited. All right, <laughs> thank you. Cynthia.